let's talk about sculpting reverb. So there are two main ideas that I want to talk about today. One is the idea of sculpting reverb. It's something that I've been having a lot of fun with lately. And the other is I get questions from students all the time about where to put your reverb and what the point is when you separate it onto an aux track versus putting it on a regular track. So those are kind of the two things that I'm going to try to address today. So the example session that I'm going to be using today is a track by an artist named Monse. She's flipping amazing. She's wonderful. We worked on this track together. And this track is actually coming out, I believe, on May 25th. So um, I forget exactly how it works out. It may or may not be out by the time this video goes live. But I will put a link to her Spotify in the description below so you can go check out what she already has out and or this track depending on when this video comes out. So what I think I'll do is I'll start by playing a little bit of the verse so you can get an idea for what the example song is like. There's a lot of reverb in it, which is why I thought it would be a good example for this video. So I'm just gonna do period three period on my numeric keypad and that brings my cursor here to the three, the third marker. So that is verse one. And I'm just gonna hit play so you can hear it. So it gives you an idea. Tons of, <laughs> it's just going and going. Tons of space, right? So what I think we'll do, we have a room reverb here, but I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about vocals and vocal reverb so we can have that idea of when to put something on a track versus when to put something on an aux. So I have a separate aux for my verb and I have a couple other effects auxes as well. And then I have the main vocals aux, lead vocals aux, which is something that I commonly do. And I'll have this main one be kind of more the drier one in my mind and then for things that are more of an effect that I might want to automate up and down, I add separate auxes for those. And I add separate auxes for things that I want to sculpt, which is kind of the answer that we're, we're going to arrive at here in a second. Um, the room reverb thing, that's a little bit different, right? Because I have a ton of different instruments going out to that room reverb. So see, it's the room reverb bus. And you'll notice that I have a lot of things going out to that within my session. So... But I have some vocals in here. Um, siren, flute, uh, let's see, whistles, guitars, keys, lots of stuff going out to this room reverb. I even have the main drum aux going out a little bit. So that's a little different, right? That's when we want to kind of get everything summing together and then going out to a reverb. And that helps because, you know, in a real space, the sounds do add together. They do get summed in a sense, right? And then they bounce around in the space together. So they're not getting their own distinct reverbs. It's all summed together in a physical space. I hope that makes sense. So let's look at these vocals. So these are the lead vocals. This track is also the lead vocals. And then this track as well, we just have a few little like ad libs that were kind of treated similarly to the lead vocals. So they're all going out bus 17, 18. And then you'll notice they all go into this lead vocals aux which is then going out to the main. So we have that like dry signal, right? So in this track, it's fairly dry, right? It's what I would consider to be dry. So I have a little bit of distortion. It's very subtle. Um, well, it's fairly subtle. I have some compression, some multiband compression, and I have an EQ. So it's all stuff that's pretty dry. And then that is going out elsewhere. So let me do command equals to switch to the mix window and I'll find my track here. It's a little bit easier, at least for my brain, to, to look at things here. So often what I'll do is then I'll have another bus that goes out to these affected tracks. But what I decided to do in this instance is send out from the actual audio tracks to these extra ones. So these extra ones take in a different bus than the main one. They're taking in bus 19 and 20. Sometimes I go out from here and sometimes I go out from here. And I just decide what I wanna do based on how I want the sound to be, right? So if you want the audio to go through these plugins first, and then that gets sent out to the reverbs and the delays, that's the source audio for the reverbs and delays, then you should put it on here. But if you want the audio to be a little less processed, so minus these, 
and have that less processed version go out to your reverb and your delay tracks, then I would put it on the actual audio tracks here like I did in this session. And it kind of depends um, on what I'm doing. I'd say the majority of the time I'm probably actually sending out from the aux track, but it, it totally depends. Like everything in audio, right? It depends on what you're doing. There's no one answer for everybody. That's kind of the beauty of it. So sometimes I will put reverbs and stuff like that delays on the actual audio tracks but the main reason why I like to separate them out and get my own aux track is because then I'll have more control over sculpting and changing that reverb by itself without that dry audio. So what I like to do is I'll put something like the reverb, whatever the main thing is. You know, I have reverbs, I have delays. It kind of depends on what I'm doing, right? But we're going to use reverb as the example today. And then I put the mix all the way up to 100%. And then what I effectively do is I mix in the reverb using this fader. And so if that's all I'm doing, there's not a huge difference between putting this reverb at the end of these audio tracks and then changing the mix knob instead of using the fader. But there are a few advantages to doing it this way. Not that this is inherently better than doing it the other way, right? It just depends on what you want. But for example, these three tracks in this session are going to be summed together before they are sent through this reverb now. So instead of having three separate instances of reverb on each of these tracks and each of these tracks individually feeding into the reverb and then you sum the reverb together afterwards, we are getting the, the tracks, those get summed together and then it gets sent out to the reverb. So with, you know, with these first two, that's not a huge difference because they don't overlap in time, right? So if you remember, this one goes during the first chorus and then, you know, the other ones for the rest of the time. But if these were overlapping, that would be much more of a consideration. And with this one, it's much more of a consideration. So that can make things sound a little more natural, right? Because again, in a physical space, sounds will get blended together and then go through the reverb. The other advantage is I use less processing power, right? So I don't have three separate instances of a reverb. It's going out through just one to make a similar sound, right? Now, the other thing, and maybe one of the biggest reasons that I've been focusing on for why I like to do things this way, is that you can then sculpt the reverb separately. So a lot of reverbs, we have things like the EQ high cut or the EQ, you know, EQ low cut, and you can sculpt it to some extent within the actual plugin, right? But with this mode of operating, right, you can have a bunch of plugins after it that are only affecting the reverb. Whereas if I have a reverb on this audio track and then I add like an EQ and a compressor and all that stuff, it's affecting both the dry and the wet signal. So you have a little more control if you separate it out onto an aux track and then you add your plugins that way. So one thing that I like to do, you can see it here, is I like to sculpt the reverb with an EQ. So I like to cut you know, like all of the lows. Sometimes I get way more extreme with it than I have here. And I like to cut a lot of the highs and kind of live in more of the mid range. And that's so that the reverb doesn't fight with other stuff as much. And it just kind of adds that like, almost like analogy ambience to the piece without fighting with the low end, without having too much high end to make it, you know, too abrasive to whatever. But it, it depends on the effect you want. Sometimes I'll, I'll mess with the highs a little bit more. Um, usually I'm cutting a lot of the lows, though, and a lot of times it's more than this. The other thing that I'll do a lot is I'll add dynamic processing. So I'll use something like a multiband compressor or a dynamic EQ to reduce frequencies that get a little bit too loud sometimes. And that can help prevent muddiness in your mix that's being introduced by the reverb specifically. So that's a lot of fun. You can do like the make dynamic thing or you can add like, a, you know, like I have here on the reverb. Um, although I would be boosting like I did here. Well, I don't usually boost stuff with reverb at least. Like 99% of the time I'm, I'm not boosting stuff. But that's just my choice, right? I don't, I'm not sure exactly why I do that. It's because I think usually with reverb, you, you get a lot in and then you want to, or at least my instinct is that I want to remove stuff. I don't know. Now I'm like talking through it to myself right now. But anyway, another thing that I like to do a lot is I like to add distortion or saturation to, for example, a delay. I love doing that. And so when I have it on a separate aux track like this, I can add that distortion, add that saturation and have it easily affect only the delay. So I love doing that. And, you know, then it's not affecting the dry signal. It's just affecting the delay. So that's a lot of fun to do if you haven't tried that. 
I also like to compress things differently sometimes. So it's fun sometimes to way over compress an effect like a delay um, or to compress a reverb slightly differently to help it kind of like pop out a little bit more, for example. So that's that. those are some other ideas that you can play with. And, you know, just separating it out onto its own aux track really helps you have that control to to tweak the sound and sculpt the sound in a more detailed way that you wouldn't have if you just put it on the regular track, the regular audio track, or you wouldn't have it as much. It helps you arrive at a different sound. So like with this one, for example, let me just play the same part of the song and I will bypass this EQ so you can get a sense of the difference, right? So I'm just gonna hit play, listen to the reverb and listen to how it changes when I have the EQ on versus off. The other thing, right, is let me just add like a little, little bit of, let's see, I'll do some distortion here. And I'm just going to, let me see, I, sometimes I like doing tu tube into tape. And I think I'm like mimicking something in my head when I do that. Sometimes I'll do, I like tube and tape the most. I'll do like some combo of those two. And then I usually do this like very, um, just a little bit. Um, but actually, maybe I'll crank it up a little bit because it's a delay. Let's see. Let's listen to this. She laughs at your text. This indifference is driving you mad. It's all about the chase. She's not. And, you know, a lot of times to, to kind of level match before and after the plugin, I'll use the trim value here. But you can hear how it has way more texture, right, when I add this. So that's something that would be a lot harder to do without separating it out onto its own aux track. So, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Again, just to summarize, right, if you have a bunch of tracks that are, you know, in the same category, like a lead vocals, it can save you processing power to not have to put three or however many separate instances of the plugin and just have it on its own aux instead. You have a lot more control over sculpting it and changing the sound of the specific effect without it affecting the dry part of the signal, right? The regular part of the signal, whatever you want to call it. But with reverb, if you're trying to get a little closer to realism when you're mimicking an acoustic space, then this can help you, right? Because sound sources, when they're in a physical space, the sound gets summed and it bounces around in the space, right? So they're not getting their own separate little, you know, you don't have like five instances of the same room when a band's playing together in the room. You don't have the singer all by themselves in the room and then, um, you know, the drummer in a separate instance of the same room, right? That's kind of what you're doing when you take the same reverb plugin and you copy it across multiple um, multiple different tracks or or types of tracks right so so you know that's why we often have something like a room reverb track where it's like everything's getting summed together and then going through that so i think that's all i have for today i hope you liked it let me know what you think in the comments below as always like comment subscribe hit the notification bell i'd appreciate all of that stuff and i do have a patreon so lately we've been focusing a lot on the discord server we're hanging out on there chatting sharing articles videos stuff like that um, sharing our mixes sharing our work talking about all things audio and music production and um, it's been a lot of fun we have a book club on there so if you feel so inclined you can check out my patreon it's patreon.com slash kato noise and other than that i come out with new videos every wednesday and thank you so much for hanging out okay you know what i found out today so i listened to this podcast called Twenty Thousand hertz i love it um it's 20k.org is their website if you haven't heard of them their their podcast is so good they talk about like all things audio basically um, but they had an episode called The Spatial Race recently. And, you know, one of the things they talked about in that or one of the people that they talk about in that is Alan Bloomline. And um, if you don't know about Alan Bloomline, like, go look him up. He's very interesting. He did a lot of the early stereo stuff. He's got like a microphone configuration named after him, like all, lots of stuff. But I didn't know that he died in a plane crash. 
That was new to me. And I, I teach about him to my students at uh, the college here in San Diego where I teach. But um, yeah, I don't know. I guess that's my little factoid that I found out today. Ooh, I also just got this art framed. I don't know if you can, I don't know if you can see it. I'll go get it. So I got this directly from the artist at this thing called Designer Con. It's in an Anaheim every year. And um, I just love it. I think it's so fun and silly. I don't know. I just love it. But I finally got it framed. I got it in like November and I finally was able to get it framed recently. So I'm going to put this up in the studio somewhere. I just have to pick where. I'll put a link to this artist in the description if I can find their their page. I follow them on Instagram. I know I do. So I'll see if I can link to that in the description. They're pretty rad. <sighs> okay. On to the next thing, I guess. <laughs> 